Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Chris and I'm a software engineer. Uh, my main domain is quality and performance. Um, if it comes to performance, it's uh, compilation time as well as uh, runtime. Um, I love writing libraries and hence uh, I'm an author of Proposed to Boost Dependency Injection as well as modern version of uh, Metastate machine libraries, which I hope they reflect uh, the virtues I just talked about. Because enough about me. Uh, moving on to the presentation today, I would like to amuse you with um, the future, possibly the future of the web. Uh, and for uh, <coughs> this talk, so at first we'll talk about the game, what we are going to implement. Uh, just to give you the, the basics of uh, what we will be talking about. After that, we'll have an overview about MScript and WebAssembly, which uh, allow us to uh, deploy to the web. And we'll talk briefly about um, those three libraries which uh, I used. So, ranges, uh, DI, and SML. Uh, and as well, we'll talk about the design. Implementation will be the main part. And the demo will be the fun part because I don't think that you often see a C++14 game on the slide. So that might be fun. We shall see how it will go. So I guess we can start. So the game we are going to implement, it's a simple match-free game. Has anyone played Candy Crush or similar game before? OK, a few hands. Uh, all right, so I'll just explain the core mechanics. So. The basic idea is that you swipe two items and you try to get match three, match four, match five, or match L. When you swipe them, you remove them from the board, you scroll the board, you generate new items uh, <coughs> before the scrolling, and after that you go to the process again. And uh, basically, the aim is to score as many points as possible. So the game is pretty simple. If you're really bored already, uh, you can even play it right now. Just go to this uh, link and you can try it out. But uh, I recommend to stay focused. Uh, we'll see how it's done and we'll play it later. So let's take out the overview. So as I said before, we'll use the mscript10 uh, version to deploy to the web. And the way mscript actually works, it takes C++ code uh, and uh, the LLVM AST, because it's based on Clang, it's converted to uh, JavaScript, SMA, JS uh, format, which we'll talk about in, in a sec. And basically, that's HTML5, we, which we can run on the, on the web. So it's not a lot of, it's a lot of magic, but the concept is pretty easy. We can, we, we get the C++, we translate it to a, uh, JavaScript, and we run uh, this part. Optionally, uh, the future of the web allows us to do uh, web assembly, which we'll talk in a sec, so I won't tell much about it right now. In order to compile it, Uh, we just use em, em C++, which is like uh, the compiler, like Clang C++. And you can see that we actually get HTML or another format we want. We can get J uh, JavaScript as well. And after that, we can run it in the browser. So what is this mysterious uh, SM, SMM, SAM, JS? Uh, so it's a JavaScript. It's a JavaScript you would never write yourself. Because it's statically typed in a weird way, we'll see that. Uh, it's, it has manual memory management, uh, so everything is allocated on the, on the, on the beginning and after that, uh, uh, and things are referring to the, on the heap. It's not as fast as native, obviously, but it's much faster than Java, JavaScript itself. It just uh, twice as slow as native. 
That's what uh, at least they claim. On the other hand, the future of the web is WebAssembly. WebAssembly is <coughs> quite unique contribution of all major browsers. Uh, so Microsoft, Google Chrome, and Mozilla got together and they discussed the format and there is a standard, like C++ standard, about how to do it right. It's a binary format, it's a memory safe, and it claims to be a native speed. The binary is a, the compiler they actually provide these days. And they actually have WebAssembly Explorer. Has anyone seen C++ Compiler Explorer, which was talked a lot recently about? So they have a similar uh, tool, which you can see it here. So you can go, uh, you can write some C++ code and see the assembler for, for, for the browser you are in. So let's take about a simple example. If you want to uh, just add two numbers and uh, see what kind of output both of these approaches will give us, we can just compile it with the SMHES flag or binary flag, which will do it for the web assembly. And then we'll see. So that will we get for the SMHES, that's JavaScript. However, you can see this <coughs> pipe, uh, the zero, which guarantee in the JavaScript that there will be 32 bit integer. That's the way the static typing is done in, in the SMHS. Uh, it's not the code you write yourself, most likely. You will see later on how terrible this code looks. So, mm. so just wait for it. So if it comes to WebAssembly, uh, WebAssembly is first compiled to the AST. So it's pretty much the same as LLVM AST, just uh, mm, for the web. And they have other restrictions because they uh, try to be memory safe. So there are a few differences. However, the approach is similar. And that's what we get as the output is, as you see, assembler. Uh, it's not much here to do. We use uh, stack pointer. We add two values and we subscribe uh, to remove the, the, the stack pointer. And the binary output uh, is what will be run by the browser. Okay, are there any questions related to WebAssembly or mscripten? Is the approach more or less clear? Make sense? Okay. So let's talk briefly about the libraries we are going to use. So the first one is uh, range, with, range uh, v3, which is developed by Eric Nibler. Has anyone used it uh, already? Has anyone used both ranges? Okay, a couple of people. So our approach is pretty similar. Yeah. It's a header only, requires just STL and meta, which is just the meta programming library uh, Eric is using. It has minimal overhead, claims to implement all the standard algorithms. It's supported by major compilers, even Microsoft compiler with a bit of work around this supporting it these days. It's based on concepts and therefore gives you a bit of better message, uh, compile error messages. However, the compilation times are not as fast as they could be. So, hello world for, the, for you who uh, don't know ranges. So instead of passing uh, two iterators, we can just pass the vector to the sort. And uh, the nice facility uh, which is provided by the ranges library is that you can actually <coughs> print uh, what you get from the range. So in that case, we can't uh, print the vector, but we can uh, print the view of the vector. So if you compile that, you can see it, it's not that fast because it compiles almost a second, just this example but it gives us uh, the sorted elements uh, in a nicer fashion than STL. The main uh, thing which is awesome about ranges are views. We are going to use them a lot today. So basically the idea is that we have a non-mutable custom snapshot of the sequence. So we cannot change the sequence, but we can uh, have a view which uh, points to some elements of the sequence. This way, we can do a lot of magic on 
the sequence we want, and after that just uh, apply it in place, for example, via actions, <coughs> which we'll talk about in a sec. So in this example, uh, we have a range, uh, we have a vector with uh, 10 elements, uh, we drop the first three, and after that take two, and we'll just get four and five. And so I guess it's very straightforward and easy to deal with. Actions, actions are another concept which allow us to mutate in place. So if you have a vector and we would like to sort it uh, and to get the unique values, that's the way you can do it in, in ranges. Uh, <coughs> as you can see, the pipeline operator is used quite often. That's the main design behind the ranges. Uh, <coughs> and obviously, ranges allow us to use algorithms so we can, uh, basically it's the same idea as STL, just we don't have to pass uh, begin and end. We, although we can, we can specify par, uh, part of the ranges, like part of the uh, sequence, or the best uh, of all, we can pass the view. Okay, another library which we'll talk about is uh, library I developed and proposed to boost. Uh, is anyone familiar with dependency injection? More or less, uh, that's good. I would claim that every one of you probably is using dependency injection either way, because it's all about the const construction. Uh, in the literature you can often uh, see that it's uh, referring to the Hollywood principle, don't call us, we'll call you, which means that our dependencies are injected by a constructor mostly, instead of being constructed and maintained by us. So if you have a coffee maker, without dependency injection, we'll create them ourselves, and with DI, they'll be passed to us. So we don't have to care about the, maintain, the maintainability of it. And that's basically it. So if you're using constructors and pass or what you need for the uh, for your object, you probably use dependency injection. It's not all that simple uh, for the library. The library is uh, quite simple. It's just three kind of code, one header. It's written in metaprogramming fashion. There's no ifs, virtuals, exceptions, compiles with no RTTI, no exceptions. There's no runtime overhead, compiles, very quick, quicker than Java. It's supported by most compilers and keeps nice error messages. So that's the idea behind the dependency injection framework, which I proposed. Uh, so instead of creating hello world and passing uh, objects, we just bind them before. So for example, we have two interfaces here, hello, uh, I world and I hello and we would like them to be passed into our hello world. So we just bind I hello to hello, I world to world, and after that we just create a hello world. And appropriate types and objects will be passed into the hello world. Uh, one thing which is important and gives us a lot of uh, 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 usability is the fact that we don't have to care about the constructor, we can refactor the constructor. For example, if we change the order of I world, I hello, or I hello becomes a unique pointer or something like that, all those changes will be handled automatically. We don't have to change anything. So make injector will stay the same, create will stay the same. So we are free of uh, maintaining this boilerplate code, which is uh, quite handy if it comes to larger projects when you have a lot of dependencies to inject. So as I said, it compiles fast, so it's one uh, um, millisecond to compile uh, this hello world. And the assembler is the same as make unique, so we don't pay any overhead for using this library. Uh, so it's like, uh, we talked recently a lot about leveraging zero cost attractions. <laughs> I would go even further, we should leverage zero cost <coughs> libraries as well as, as this one. Uh, one more thing about the, this library is the fact that if you miss uh, binding, 
it won't give us a terrible error message. That's the whole message will be uh, provided by the by the compiler. So it uses uh, concept emulations and and a lot of magic in order to support that. However, you as you see, the error will be uh, quite obvious. So you cannot create a uh, hello world because the constraint is not satisfied. And you will get a hint that you should bind it. Okay, the, the, I just wanted to compare that to Java, but I will have to speed it up a bit. So uh, there are Java libraries as well. Uh, and if it comes to compilation times, I just wanted to show that BoostDI actually, proposed BoostDI is fa much faster than Dagger 2, which is a compile, compile time library for Java, which do exactly the same. So I have the benchmark when I uh, check the same stuff, uh, create, just create objects, and uh, as you can see, execution time, it's, there's no point even com in comparing that because uh, we don't have an overhead, and obviously they do because they do reflection, uh, and <coughs> compilation times are still faster than most of the Java stuff. And another library which we'll use is SML, which is state machine. Is anyone familiar with UML, state machines, diagrams? Awesome. So, again, a nice library. Hello world. So, uh, that's the UML specification. We have like initial state, which is the dot. We have uh, some flow, which will be uh, expressed via the diagram. We have a state, which is hungry. We have the event, which is eat. After that, we have a guard. Is lunch time. If the, that guard is actually alright, we go for food. We eat in. When we are full, we are done. And you can see here in the yellow note, uh, the no UML notation is source state plus event guard uh, uh, slash ac forward slash action destination state. Has anyone used both MSM or state chart? Oh, okay, one person. So, <coughs> uh, so basically, the idea is that a state machine will implement this hello world, uh, this, uh, this diagram using uh, DSL in, in C++. So we have lambdas for it's lunch time, go for food. We have events which are just tracked, and after that we. Uh, have a transition table. The star is the initial state plus event. Uh, guard is lunch time. Go for food. We go to the another state, and that's basically the flow. So it's one to one to to the diagram. This way we can translate. We can have a script which will generate. We can actually generate the uh, diagram out of this code, and vice versa. So it's really handy and useful uh, as well. The way we use it, we just process events. Uh, the nice uh, f fact about this library is, the f uh, is that it doesn't take any space; it's just one byte for the for the uh, for the st uh, for the state. We have to store it, and after that, we process events. And the assembler which will be produced is basically just move. So here we just had this um, uh, printing going for food. However, uh, the process uh, event will just uh, move one to the register and return two. That's all what will be done. So the process event actually is O1 because it generates a jump table as compil at compile time. As you can see as well, it's compiled uh, really fast. So uh, you haven't used the amount of boost, but however, I have a comparison and you can see that, for example, boost MSM uh, which is written in C++03 is not that fast uh, to compile in comparison to, to, for example, this library. Okay, let's move to the game. Uh, so design. We'll use model view controller in order to separate the UI and the business logic. Is everyone familiar with this pattern? Yeah, most people, so I won't be talking much about it. it good for, it's good for applications and games. So, although I, I'm creating a game here, we uh, could use the same code to just uh, create a UI. Just, for example, instead of using Vue uh, as a graphic library, we could use Qt or something like that. 
Uh, so the main design is that we'll have a game, we'll have a controller, which will be player, that will be a state machine which will be used by, uh, which will be using SML, as I said you know, uh, before. Switcher will be sub state machine for the player. We'll go into details, so no worry. Uh, for now, we'll have a board, which will be the, our model, and it will be using ranges. And view, view will be something we won't be talking about because it's not much fun, and we'll just use SDL2. We'll use SDL2 library uh, because it's supported by mscripten and WebAssembly, uh, so the, they implemented a port for it, so we can't use like SFML or Qt with them scripted, but SDL2 is possible, so that's why it was chosen. We can use also OpenGL, but that will be a bit more hassle to do. Any questions related to design? Make sense? All right. So, how will we go about it? Uh, so, I, when I was preparing this talk, I was thinking of uh, making it a tutorial so I will just code something, but I guess that would be really hard to, to maintain and I probably would make a lot of mistakes. So I took the approach just to explain the code and to do so, I will start from main and we'll go through all the layers and implement basically all the code on the slides. If you have any questions, just jump in. I may go too fast or too slow depending on, on the slides. So, our main is just two lines long. At first, we'll use dependency injection with the configuration, which we'll explain in a second. And after that, we'll just create the game and we'll just play it. So, seems simple for now, I guess. What is this configuration? So, that's the part where the magic begins. So, the configuration is <coughs> used by the dependency injection library in order to set up the proper uh, types uh, to proper interfaces to types and give configuration as well as initial data. So as I said before, we are using that in order to not to have much hassle with dealing with refactorings and SML on its own is using DI as well to pass uh, dependencies. This way we can when we have a lambda, for example, as I said, is lunchtime, and we will, uh, would like to have, for example, a data with like food or something as a first parameter or more parameters in it, DI will just inject it, and we don't have to care about and change anything. Uh, so it's really easy to maintain and refactor. So let's go one, one uh, line by la line. So the first line, we just bind I view, which is a view for, for the game to SDL view because we'll, as I said, we'll use SDL2. After that, we just bind config. Config is just some data for the game, so like the title, the board size, uh, nothing special. And after that, we have the initial level. We won't be loading it from, from the disk or anything like that. I just specified uh, the board. So these numbers are colors, I think, there are six colors allowed or something like that. At least I have data for like six different images. So, three, five, one, if you have imagination, you can see, I don't know, candies, depending what would you like, you can see whatever. Uh, okay, so view, as I said, uh, we'll just talk about the interface here. Interface is quite simple. We have a, an option to show the grid. Uh, grid is like the item, so we can put it on the position, which will be like 1, 1, or 0, 0, let's say in the corner, or 8, 8 in the other corner. With the color, color is the, the number here, like 3, 5, or any other number, and the view will take care of displaying it on, the, on, uh, on our uh, display. And get position, we need that uh, to translate the position of the click. So if we click on the board, uh, we, we just got the relative numbers. We have to translate it to the position on the board. So because we will get like 350, uh, 288, and for example, that'll be 
num position three, uh, comma two uh, on the board. So we have to know that. And update is just to render the view. So the game loop, like <coughs> like all gamers like, will have a game loop in which we'll just uh, play the game. So uh, as you've seen in the in the main function, that was the uh, method which we were calling. Uh, and how does it work? So at first we have the state machine player, uh, which is a, a SML state machine. We'll talk about it later. It's not important at that time. So dispatch event. The problem with the state machine like boost, MSM, or SML is the fact that they takes types and not runtime types. So the specific types like, as I shown before, eat or full, and SDL2, if you use it, uh, gives us a runtime tab. So we have a SDL event, which is a union, and it has a type in it which discriminates which field we should use, which is not really handy for us if we want to have really fast code. So in order to do that, uh, I wrote the facility, SML actually support this facility to create a jump table out of uh, some uh, range. So for example, here we have event, which is just a type. After that, we have first event, last event. Actually, I have a slide how, to, how it's done. So let me rephrase uh, that for a sec. So in order to support transition from runtime type to just a type, we have IDs. So it's like a type trait. So we have quid, which has ID, key pressed has ID2. It can take constructor, SDL event, and just take the data which you want because you know that this type is from, uh, of this type which you provided the ID for. And the make dispatch table, uh, it's a nice facility because <laughs> it allows us not to repeat ourselves. So, before, because we have to uh, have the types in the transition table either way. So in order to generate a, a jump table out of those types, we can just th uh, go through all the types in the, in, the, in, the, in the state machines we have, combine them in the jump table, and for all events, uh, numbers, IDs for the first up to last event, we can just generate uh, uh, basically a jump table for like key down will be some number like six let's say and we have a lambda which just process a uh, proper type of this event. Make sense? So we just basically have a jump table. We don't have to uh, maintain that. Okay, so let's get to the fun part. So right now we'll talk a bit even more than a bit about the logic, so we will use the ranges. So, as I said, board is the main object of, of the game, so where the logic is happening, all the stuff, all the magic is here, basically. So, our interface is quite simple. We have swipe, which is like we swipe two items. After that, we can check whether it is a match or not. If it's a match, we do the match. After that, we have to scroll uh, the board in order to, you know, to, we have to remove the match, scroll the board, uh, and that's basically it. And we repeat that uh, later on. So our view, usually, if you see the code for games like that, you will see just a plain array with like two dimensions. However, we are going to use ranges. So that's not really convenient for us, and therefore we'll use just an RI, STD RI, because ranges will give us the facility to have a view. So the column or any other view is not a big deal for us. So on the bottom you can see that RI of let's say board three times three will look like that. And uh, it's pretty much the same as uh, two dimension RI. So how can we actually get from this one dimension array to let's say two dimension or any dimension array by having the, the by raising ranges? So 
when we have this uh, array, we can actually take the row, for example. So with the ranges, we can have a view which will translate our array to the view which will just take some of the elements. In that particular case, we can just take the, uh, the line in the middle, which is quite handy because we can, after that operate on that line, we don't have to care much about anything else. How it can be done with the rangers? Uh, it's not a lot of magic here. So we have a view. After that, we just take the, the, the row number which we would like to, to take, and we need to know uh, how many elements we have. So, as I said before, we just use the pipeline operator. We drop elements and after the take. So, in that case, if I'll go back, we'll just drop the first three and take the next three. Uh, therefore, we have to know the, the width or, or of, the, uh, of the view. We could uh, use potentially slice as well, uh, but we'll have to just do a bit of more uh, computations there. As you see in the, in the example here, example test, uh, if you have the row of, uh, if you have the view of uh, six elements and we take uh, two, we'll just get uh, the second two. Make sense? So I guess this one would be uh, easy to follow. So if you want a column, we just we just have to do it a bit differently, I guess. Uh, uh, fortunately for us, there is a, a helper in the ranges v3, which is the stride. Stride takes the modulo uh, element. So here we'll just drop n elements to just get to the column we want, and after that we just try it depending on the width. So if, we come, uh, so if you have three elements and we want the second column, we drop the first one and just try it. Uh, and the second one, let's say the width is three, uh, four, one, six, one, I guess. Make sense? Okay, so right now we have to add, uh, <coughs> focus on the match. So let's say we made the swi swipe. We had the, and we have to check whether this swipe is actually winning or not, because depending on whether it's is winning or not, we have to do all the stuff. We have to scroll the board, and move matches. So in order to do so, and the idea is simple. Uh, you know, what is a match? Yeah, and that's what. Sorry, that's what I want to like to say. When we have a, a view like that with the board. In order to verify what is the match, we have to kind of, in a simple way, verify all the elements. And if there are three next to each other, we have match three. If there are four next to each other, we have match four. We have to also have to go the column-wise, the uh, row-wise. So it's, not, it, it's quite complex. Uh, and the solution here is that We'll try to find the match in the row or column. So in the first example, let's say we'll just first uh, the first row. We'll try to look for the color three because we know the information from the swipe. Because when we swipe, we know which elements we actually swipe. So we know the color of the elements. Uh, and then we can just go through the row or, or the column, or, or let's say the view, and just check how many elements are uh, uh, in the order of that uh, after this element, and then we can just return the beginning and the length of uh, of the elements we actually found. So let's have an example here. We have a view which is a row or a column view because we don't really have to care about it. And after that, we verify whether the swipe the the item we wanted to swipe, we actually swiped, for example, element three, and we verify whether, <coughs> whether it's exactly the same. If it is, if the color we, we, we provided, <coughs> then we can count how many elements uh, are in it. And the size of it, the size of uh, how many threes we actually got, 
will be much free. If you got much uh, size two, it means that we didn't get a match. If you got much size four, it's much four. If it will be size five, it will be much size five. So how we can implement that in the ranges? So we can take the int, which is the infinite sequence of ints, because uh, uh, ranges are lazy, and therefore we can generate infinite ranges of numbers. So in, that, in this case, it would be like 0, 1, 2, up to any number you want. We take the size of it, and after that we just transform and count how many colors we actually got there. And in order to verify whether we actually got it, we have to find these matches and look for the ones, which is uh, like true here. So we compare them, we got like true, true, false, true, 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 false. We verify how much we have, we got the iterator for that, and we can count elements, and we can get the distance of it, and return the beginning and the length. So this way, we'll get the uh, number of matches in the, in the given view. More or less clear? Okay, so that's our tests for that. Uh, let's just focus on one. So if you have a view 13232 and we would like to match n and verify whether the free is there, we won't get it. And in the second example uh, below, we'll see that the, the begin will be one and the length will be three because we got it. And on the right side, on the bottom, we'll get match five because there are five elements which are in order. Okay, so right now, uh, having that, we can go a bit further, which is, is much. Because when we swipe two elements, uh, it's not enough that we'll verify the, the one view, which is like raw view. We have to check whether the, the swipe is in column and in the row as well for the both elements which we swipe. So we swipe two elements, we have to verify column and row for one and the second one. And that's what we're actually doing here. So this one is quite easy. We have this helper match n. We take the row of this. <coughs> and uh, we do that the same for the uh, uh, other one. So this one, is, it will be just for the one element, and we'll have to do that for both elements which we swipe. And the final one, which is match, in order to uh, scroll the board afterwards and do all stuff with it, we transform the given match, uh, so all the mm, elements which were matched into, into the positions, so here, when we have a view and we found our match, these fives which were matched will return the positions of those elements into our view. So the first five is on the position 11, the second on 12, and so forth. How we do that? Well, this one is uh, quite easy because we have the match, and in order to get the positions, we just as before we get the int, the sequence, we take the element and transform, which return the, uh, that does that get positions? So, get positions which return us the number. <coughs> uh, in order to get the number, we have to multiply it by width and get the beginning. And after that, we just sort it and get the unique number of the positions. And any question related to that? Okay, so in our case, if you have a, a, the given view, if you uh, want to check match for two and three, <coughs> and we'll, let's focus on the second one. Uh, we can see that there is a match, and we'll just get two, five, and eight. Well, we can't see there is a match because match is in the column. Sorry about that. So if you have uh, imagination, you have to um, divide it by three. So one, two, three is the first column, four, three, three is the second, seven, two, three is the third, and the three is the match on two, five, and eight, which is the column, the third column. 
and the scroll. Uh, when we have all these matches, we remove them. We can just scroll the remaining elements. So for example, zero is the match which was found. We remove it, and we would like to scroll it with the, third, with the below element, because we always scroll down in order to, you know, to pull the element from the top. And this one is really easy. Uh, is everyone familiar with the rotate from STL? So it's basically the algorithm we need. It just rotates the element. So if you have, uh, for example, 100 zero, zero, and we rotate by 1, we'll get 0, 1, 1, zero, one zero. So the only thing we have to remember is just to advance by the amount of elements uh, which were above. So in this case, uh, the second column is important. We uh, scroll it by, by 1, and the, the, zero, the 1 is in the middle instead of the beginning. Make sense? OK, so let's move to the state machines right now. So that's our logic. We'll use that in the state machines in order to operate on, the, on, the, uh, on our, our player and the swipe, which we'll do. So as I said, that's UML. So let me just go through it a, a bit. So we have the first item, uh, which is we clicked on the item. And after that, we wait for the second item, which means that we swiped, which is we moved our thumb or something like that. After that, we, when we let it go, we check whether we swipe, which happened. If it's positive, which means that we got a match anywhere out of these swipes, we match the items and go to the switcher and let us process all this magic which we were talking about. And if not, we'll just swipe back and we get uh, the same position which was before. So uh, let's implement that with the SML. So as I said, uh, here we have initial state, and the action is showboard uh, as the first item. So that's our initial state of the game. So when we created a, a game in the main, uh, this uh, transition will happen because it's a uh, uh, anonymous transition, which is happening each time when you start the uh, state machine, and we'll end up in the first item, which we're waiting for the player to do. So how does it work? So that's our lambda for the show board. We pass our board, we pass our view, and we'll just show grid for all the elements in our board. As I said before, we use dependency injection in order to, to pass all the objects to the lambdas, therefore we don't have to care about maintaining anything. So all this data is actually taken from this configuration which, we, uh, which I talked about in the beginning. So view will be I view, board will be just the board which was, uh, <coughs> it wasn't even defined because DI, CI, that's just a tag and it's constraint, so it probably have to be reused by all the types, all the objects which will require it uh, in the scope of the injector. So. In this case, when you have a different lambda which requires board as well, the same board will be passed. Does that make sense? All right. So as I said before, just to recap, uh, if you change anything in the show board, like uh, the, the order or you know types, or we pass event, all of that will be handled by DI. We don't have to care about that. We just focus on the on the logic, so it's really convenient for us to uh, to write the code and don't focus on boilerplate new stuff. Okay, so let's go further with the state machine. When we are in the first item, uh, we wait for the down, which is like we wanted to swipe, uh, like we click the button, for example, in the desktop version. We select the item and we go to the second item. Uh, which is the state. Uh, here I just wanted you to show that with the M script and then when assembly, we can actually use JavaScript in C++. Uh, for desktop version, this macro is just false, <coughs> but for the uh, uh, version in the browser, we'll just check, oh, that's a browser. That's actually a device, because on device, we don't have button click 
uh, we just have finger down because we touch. And therefore we have to use a different object from the union provided by the SDL. Make sense? Scary? Uh, so, and the select item is just to add to the selected, which is just a vector of uh, colors. We just get the position, as I said before, because we have relative numbers. Mm. And that's the test for it. After that, we have the second item. We let uh, our fun, we check what is allowed. We select item and swap items and go to the match items. So how this is allowed works, uh, we have a view, we have our elements, we have the, the event, which in this case will be, will be up. <laughs> and we just get X and Y, get the position, and if it's in a neighbor, we can then uh, proceed, because if you just, you know, if you have a board and we just swipe left corner and top left and right bottom, that doesn't make sense because there's no fun, because we can just swipe, we can just exchange any of elements. So we have to, only allowed elements has to be uh, neighbors. So if you are in the second element and we, it's not allowed, we just drop the item because we don't really care about it. Drop the item, we just get it out of the sequence. So right now, when we have the match items, so it means that it was a neighbor and it's winning. Actually, we check whether it's winning. If it's winning, we go to the switcher, which will do uh, our processing for, for, for the matches. Uh, this process is just to give how many uh, elements we got uh, to check, because we swiped two elements. So we check for both, because afterwards we'll just go one by one, because the the computer cannot generate two, two, two swipes, it just generates one. So, as, as we had before, is much it was implemented quite easily with the ranges, so for, we know that here, the asset is obviously never triggered, because, uh, because we know uh, that in the, the Match items state we can be only in the in the situation when we have two items unless we have a bug, and therefore we have to check whether there is a match for the first item and the second item, which means that we check whether both elements which we swiped uh, give us a match. If if there is no match, we swap them back. So we just we just call the swap items again, and. Clear selected, we, and we go to the first item, meaning nothing happened. Swap items, you just swipe on the board, we just swap. Because we have two elements of the board, and we just swap them, and we have a new state of the board. Okay, so this one is related to a bit to uh, UML, so. When you, when you add the switcher and the switcher will stop, uh, will finish processing, it will go back to the first item. So it means that when we, when we had a, a, a match, we go to the switcher, do this processing, and the switcher says, ah, oh, I'm done. Then we're going back to the first item and let the user proceed. So it means that we are blocking user from doing matches when the matches are happening on, on, on their own via the triggered matches before by us, if that makes sense. Right. Let's say. And here, for just for just for desktop, because obviously for the web, there's no point of uh, playing with uh, with keys like that because we can't. Uh, it's like if you have a browser and you click escape, uh, no match will happen. You won't get out of the game or something like that. Uh, you will still be in the same page. You can clear, you can close the the tab, but. But uh, the game actually here is written here is uh, capable of being deployed to Android or desktop or desktop browser or even a device browser. So therefore we have that. This, uh, this mysterious X is just the 
final state of the state machine. Uh, that was checked in the, in the main loop of the game. We, we had this while uh, state machine is x, and this x means that our, our state machine is done. There is nothing else to do, we can do because user quit. <coughs> so is key. Is key is just uh, uh, a lambda which checks whether the provided key by the user is the same key as we wanted. This way we can verify in the guard here is key escape if it is. Uh, we'll finish. So all in all, it looks like that. It's not a lot of code for just processing the player. It's all the uh, all these transitions are the same ones which I just talked about, just in the one uh, one slide. So. In my opinion, it's really easy to follow uh, state machines diagrams. If you're not really familiar, it might be a bit uh, on, on what is it. But I guess it's really easy to get used to it, and it's extremely easy to extend and um, easy to maintain and add new features in the future. So a few words about this feature, which is the part where the game is playing on its own when you make this match. So let's say we, 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 went, we made a match. After that, the board scrolled. And there is apparently a new match, because the new elements which were, which were uh, created caused another match. And we can go like that basically forever. So we have to handle that as well. So in order to do that, we check whether we have new items. If we have, we process them. If we don't, we are in the final state, which I just said, meaning the switcher is done, and we go to the first item in the other state machine. Has items. Uh, so that's our uh, event. We have RT, which is just how many, swi how many items we are going to match. For switcher, is usually is always one. For the swipe by the player, is two. And what we do in the process match? We just find matches, scroll board, generate items, and go in just a for loop here. So it's basically what, what, what the algorithm says before. So find matches. We just go for all the selected items, and we add to the matches the output of the match. So match, as I said before, returned the positions on the board. And here we just sum them up, put them in the matches, sort, and, and unique them, and that's all the matches which were uh, triggered in, 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 the, in this given swipe. After that, we scroll the board. So we take all these matches, and we scroll the board. So we will get the columns of all these matches. The we needed the positions, because uh, we have this 15, 17, 19. We get the alignment. Uh, of, uh, we get the column view of these positions, and we scroll accordingly to how many items were matched in, in that column, in that view. And that's what is happening here. And after that, we just generate new items. So let's say we have a random function. We go for the matches, and we change the board with the random, random new element, which will be up to, up to five elements. So we are done with the game this way. Any questions to the game? Uh, I hope I didn't go too fast, and more or less it's clear. So, yeah, there's a question. So, did you consider as an experiment to try to write this exact same game using uh, legacy style to compare the code size, performance, and clarity, how easy to maintain? OK, so the question is whether I did write it the same game in the older legacy kind of C style and compare uh, and benchmark it. No, I didn't. Uh, I wouldn't like to as well. <laughs> it could be useful to have benchmarks like that. Uh, I benchmarked the game and everything the way which I could, which is like, I know that, uh, for example, all these libraries I presented provide this kind of code, but I didn't, didn't check whether it would be better with, like, for example, C implementation. Ah, 
I would like to claim it will be much better because it's a compile time and everything is like just dispatch uh, or one jump table. But you know you cannot put me on that because I don't have any benchmarks for that. So sorry about that. So just to sum up how to actually compile it. <coughs> so in order to compile it to the web, we have our compiler. <coughs> There's one, just one main CPP, and there's a lot of headers, so we don't really care about that. The second line is just to use the SDL uh, libraries, probably <laughs> by inscription. After that, we pass the backend, which is the web assembly. We preload some, some plugins, data. Uh, it's just boilerplate for the AMP scripten. And after that, we can just run it in the browser. So um, a bit of details. So here you will see the difference between mscript and WebAssembly because they will provide a bit different formats. So WebAssembly, as I said before, is a binary format, so it should be much smaller, as you can see that here. So WebAssembly bin on the bottom is just one megabyte, just one megabyte, let's say, for this game. Um, and uh, SMA, uh, SMA JS is almost 10 megabytes. All, all other stuff is just a boilerplate which we don't really need. Index data is required by the script because they, all these images will be in the data there. And the index HTML looks like that. At first, we'll try to run WebAssembly, which is this index uh, uh, .wasm. And after that, if we don't have the browser which supports WebAssembly, because we have to have quite a fresh one and enable it these days, then we'll just roll back to the index.js, which is just uh, JavaScript. How does it look? So SMA.js, as I said before, it's a nightmare to look at. And that's what you can see here. That's the code. That's the code of the game. Obviously, it's not all. It's nine, nine megabytes of that. And uh, yeah, imagine deb debugging that. The, the, I would assume that the, uh, the functions are, the names are so short and there's like one line of it just in order to parse it faster. But as you see, it's not really dev friendly. What about WebAssembly? WebAssembly is like that, it's just binary. So it's, it's basically just assembler and much faster to load, much easier to do. <coughs> so, I would like to say that WebAssembly is the future and this JavaScript is just a hack. Okay, let's try it. So I think that's the first time on this conference when someone will present C++14 on the slide. I hope it won't crash. Okay, we can play it. I can, I can share the secret how to get the most points. It's like you have to match on the bottom and hope for the best. Yeah. It's quite addictive. So I'll just do one round for you. You can see that this time you're just going, yeah, I like this one. I have two more moves, so bear a second with me. I'll try this one. And game over. So I didn't show the game over stuff, but it's really easy to implement. I got 83. I think it's not bad. I don't know what's the record. Probably you can get much more. I guess you can get infinite amount, depending on your random numbers. And yeah. So to sum up, because we almost ran out of time. So C++ on the web is happening, and what I've shown today is just the beginning. So a web assembly should be established and released properly in the March 2017, and I guess in the future we'll see much more C++ on the web. Uh, as I said before, it's really good to leverage zero-cost libraries, uh, not only abstractions, at as it was mentioned a lot of times, like dependency injection and SML, they don't have any overhead and a lot of stuff which might be done during the compilation time is much better. <laughs> Ranges be free. Uh, as you may know, <coughs> Eric Nibblers is working on proposing that to the STL2 and hopefully in 2020. 
20 will get it. Maybe we'll get it earlier as a TS. I would like to say that views are really uh, powerful. As you see, it's really easy to operate on them and just get partial view and just operate. Uh, the problem with this uh, with ranges is the fact that it compiles quite slowly right now, but I guess that might be definitely improved. And last but not least, in my opinion, dependency injection plus state machine is a really powerful design which, will, which might give you, um, which might solve a lot of problems for you without tedious and boilerplate uh, and hard to maintain stuff. So with that, uh, you have the links. If you want to play the game, you can go to the first link and just play it on your device. If you have iOS, it might be slow because you probably won't have WebAssembly on, on, on your device because it's impossible to get it on the iOS. So most likely you won't have it. And uh, V8, which is Android uh, a JavaScript uh, <coughs> uh, virtual machine, is much faster because it's uh, bytecode instead of WebKit, which is kind of slow. And script and WebAssembly, Rangers, and those libraries, you can find them online. So with that, I would like to finish, and if there are any questions. <coughs>